Welcome to One on One, a daily item digital program featuring Susquehanna Valley newsmakers interviewed by daily item reporters. Today's guest is Bucknell University President Dr. John Brovman, interviewed by Eric Shikitano. All right, John. Uh, by the way, thanks for your time. Uh, of course. So Bucknell moved to uh, remote classes this week, and I guess a decision is pending for next week, which is the last week of the semester. Can you right. tell me a little bit about what will go into making that decision? Uh, it's not an algorithm, but we're obviously looking at the number of new cases per day. You know, we had three yesterday, all staff, no students. Um, we're getting test results now today from yesterday. So far, it's all zeros. So, you know, we just want to see how this plays out. Just like two weeks ago when we had seven on a Saturday, seems to always come on a Saturday from Friday test data. Um, the following week we went remote teaching only and then turned on in-class yeah. teaching again, you know, probably follow the same concept. So there's not a threshold. There's not like a magic number as you're- no there's, no, there's not a specific number. This cannot be done with an algorithm. What would you say the response is when, when you switch to remote? Do you get pushback internally? Um, from staff administration or alumni and students? Um, the only pushback we got was from some on, on that particular issue. Uh, the only pushback was um, some, some parents thinking perhaps we were being too cautious yeah. uh, and all that. But in general, people have been very supportive of our, you know, sort of aggressively safe stances and um, it's been uh, rewarding. Of the mitigation measures that you enacted coming into the fall semester, what do you think have been the most effective? Well, having the two negative tests before you could move in, I think was a huge part of it, along with the suggestion that people sort of, to the extent possible, self-quarantine at home. Um, I think that was a big part of getting going. And then a lot of communication before students arrived and after they arrived about of course, our periodic testing, uh, you know, a lot of schools opted to do symptomatic testing only, but we did full blown, uh, full population testing on a periodic basis. I think that was part of it too. Um, I think it was just the second week of the term when I sent out a, um, an email to students uh, that had the uh, uh, subject line, I think was uh, uh, mask up or pack, pack up, no, mask up or pack up, which will it be? Yeah. Um, and I, you know, that was a start of really putting it on the students, but also not, not a scolding stance, but a we're in this together stance. A lot, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of students wave at me on the street and say, mask up or pack up with a smile on their face. So they remember. And I know you've credited, you know, the, the, a large part of the student body, you know, the, the, the super majority, if you will, with, you know, following these mitigation measures. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. In, in what areas do you think they've excelled? I, I guess it's masking and distancing, right? Yeah, and, and doing what has to be done um, to um, keep this uh, effort going. Look, COVID is a, in part, a, a matter of statistics, right? Um, uh, if, if you're totally isolated, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get COVID, but we live in human society and the, a predicate of a college residential experience is a lot of association with other people. So we had to moderate that where we needed to. And we tried to though honor people's desire to be here in residence and nine out of 10 students elected to attend in, re in person. And so we thought we were validated in our judgment that students wanted to be here with our faculty, with each other, with our staff, and therefore they would do as much as they could, um, you know, to make it, uh, to make it uh, safe enough to open up. You know, there are temporary transitions to remote learning, of course, which we've already touched on, consistent testing of students and faculty, um, the announced delay to the start of the next semester and changes in how education is delivered, essentially. What concerns did administrators and faculty have with respect to the potential impact these irregularities could have on students' academic performance? And have any of them proved true? Well, I mean, again, our reason for being as a university is to educate people in small numbers at a time, in small classes, 
And so a significant personal interaction with each other and with faculty and staff. And so we know that that is, we are not operating this way optimally, but with 70 plus percent of our classes being taught uh, in the classroom uh, um, and, and with some clearly mitigated opportunities for interaction, you know, we thought this was still better than um, uh, being remote, fully remote and giving students the option, just like we gave faculty the option to teach in their desired modality. Um, and we believe all things considered, given the circumstances, it's working as well as it can. But we're not claiming that this is a, uh, a pristine experience that we normally would have. Of course, you know, we talk about the, the, the far majority of students adhering to mitigation measures. Of course, there's a minority who, who haven't. And you've been, I think, cautiously critical of, of those students' behavior, um, specifically socializing downtown and off campus. Um, do you correlate those behaviors with this spike that you've seen at the end of the semester on campus? There's no way to prove that, right? This is, a again, an issue of statistics and spread. Um, and so I can't prove that. I have, like many do, a clear suspicion uh, that it's probably related, but I, I can't prove that. Yeah. Uh, all we're trying to do is, again, remind people that this is statistical and that the less behavior of certain types that we engage in, the better chances we have. Has there been any punishment for students? Um for not adhering to these guidelines? We have we have asked students to go home and go remote, yes. About how many, or do you know the exact number? Um, I don't even know the exact number, but we're not we're not talking about that in, in public, but in fact, we have sent more than a handful of students home. We've tried very much a a you know tiered approach. And when it gets to be uh, um, you know, a, a second or third kind of offense, if you will, then we say, you know, this, this isn't working out. You're going to have to leave. Campuses, except for the military academies, campuses are open spaces, right? And so people come and go from our campus uh, and sort of in a similar vein, you know, we get asked, how can you allow strangers on your campus? I mean, yeah. it, it just doesn't make, it just betrays a lack of understanding about how a campus operates. And we're not gonna go around arresting people because we don't, you know, show me your ID, please. It, it, it doesn't work that way. And so- Sure, and it, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to insinuate that you should- No, 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 I know that. that that's but, but, but plenty, some people do. Um, is, is there any consideration given, given that we're in a pandemic um, to pulling all students on campus for next spring or perhaps next fall? To, I'm sorry, what was it quick, to pooling them? Yeah, pulling them on campus, requiring them all students to live on campus rather than. No, we don't have a, we don't have enough uh, bed spaces. Yeah, I didn't think so. Just because so many of our students came back, we don't we don't have bed spaces. John, what are you doing in the way of uh, you know training and support for your faculty to to transition to remote learning? I, I know you've done a lot of it over over the summer. It, 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 you know, yeah, it was over the summer. Our um, Libraries and Information Technology Group, or LNIT, we call them, done a tremendous job working with the Teaching and Learning Center uh, and with and various groups of, of faculty and staff to prepare for this. It was admirable enough what we did in the spring on very short notice, but with the summer intervening and with us saying all along, whatever we do, be prepared for both in-person and remote teaching yeah. Uh, we spent a lot of time and a significant resources, uh, significant amount of resources over the summer, uh, building a physical and, and sort of intellectual infrastructure for remote uh, education. And you know, it's never perfect, but it's um, uh, our, our faculty have done an amazing job in working with our staff and getting ready for this term. And I'm sure. I'm sure next term will be better still because of lessons learned in this large scale semester long uh, effort. Right, and that's what I wanted to follow up with. I imagine you're gonna be continuing this training over the, over the winter going into the, going into the spring. Uh, I'm wondering if some staff have been resistant 
to teaching remotely just because it's not what they're used to and, and, and it's not what they're comfortable with. Well, I think it, it's not a matter of being resistant. It's a matter of, gee, how am I going to accomplish what I've dedicated my life to accomplishing in, in a way that I'm used to? How can I do that remotely? And so there's no, of course, silver bullet there, but again, a lot of effort. So it was just concern over uh, being able to deliver on um, you know, a Bucknell education in the way that they normally do, which is so personalized for the most part. But I think- Look a little bit about the precautions that you had put in place coming into the semester. Were there any critical adjustments that, that the university made, you know, perhaps midway that helped mitigate the spread that, that you learned about? When we had the first time, about three, three weekends ago, I guess, when we had the seven cases on one day, uh, we went to testing the whole population once a week instead of every other week. That was probably the major thing that we did. Um, are you guys willing to share like how much Bucknell spent on testing this semester? We, we, we will spend um, on the order of uh, five to six million dollars on testing per semester. It's a very large amount of money. Yeah. Plus about um, close to close to a million dollars. Well, for the whole year, it'll be well over a million dollars for quarantine housing off campus. We also spent several million dollars on personal protective gear, new technology for classrooms, stuff we would not have done had it not been for COVID. So this has not been a inexpensive exercise. What are your expectations for the spring? Um, I guess it's too early to tell, right? I'm, we don't know what to expect next week. Yeah, it's too early to tell for sure. You know what our plans are, but right now the we see the cases soaring. So we will keep a good eye on it. We are going to have the same um, uh, paradigms that, you know, you have to have two negative tests before re returning to campus. Um, we, we just told the students today that we'll be um, shipping those tests uh, out. We need to know your address in a certain time frame so we can get them to you. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of logistics, but it'll be the same paradigm. And could the semester be further delayed um, potentially or is February 1 as late as you can go? Oh, potentially, yes. Uh, I don't think it would be delayed if we felt like we had to, we would start remote and yeah. then have students arrive later. That would be the most likely that would be the most uh, that would be the most likely alteration of our announced plans. Hey, uh, Susquehanna was doing wastewater testing. Was Bucknell doing that? We had some of our faculty very interested in this and, and, and looking at this. And I think they determined in the time frame that we had to do that. And given the number of buildings we had, it wasn't a practical um, um, technology right now for us to implement other than from a scientific, you know, interest point of view, but not as a predictor. Yeah. Um, I guess my last question, I'm just wondering, has this pandemic kind of, you know, altered your view of the future of higher education and what it might look like and, you know, how, how people might be going to college in a year, five years, 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question and a, a, a very deep one. Um, so for, for, first of all, when you say going to college, the college experience in the United States is amazingly broad, right? Yeah. Um, and so the, the Bucknell-like experience is maybe 5% of students in the country. Um, and so there's enormous diversity in our offerings in the United States of how one goes to college. Sure. Um, we also know that, and we've talked a lot pre-COVID about large scale changes that we think are coming to higher education. Again, acknowledging that there's a huge spectrum of opportunities in the country, but everyone's concerned, of course, about the cost of higher ed. We see very large shifts in demographics uh, coming to this country, um, uh, accelerated in the Northeast where Bucknell gets 80 plus percent of its students. Yeah. So, the, uh, and of course, there's a, the persistent 
uh, questions about the role of technology, which of course in COVID has really saved us. Um, all those questions were very live before COVID. So COVID is not so much created new challenges, I think as accelerated ones we knew were coming anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think uh, this will bend the arc of history, if you will, with regard to higher education. I think we're gonna be in a fortunate position of being able to look at and say, what can we learn as we return to some sense of normalcy over the next one to two years? What can we do in addition or what can we modify in how we educate our students from what we've learned, knowing that we're going to return to our residential campus, small classes, and all the other things that are a hallmark of a Bucknell education. And I imagine you have your fingers crossed for a vaccine before spring. A uh, vaccine will unlikely to strongly affect colleges in the spring. I think there's real hope with some of these recent announcements that the fall term could be a much different and better scenario given these vaccines if they plan, pan out. But when you study the vaccines um, you may know I'm the chairman of the board at Geisinger, so we're looking at all this. The Pfizer vaccine is stored and transported at minus 90 degrees. So the that I didn't know. I had heard that there was a vaccine stored at that temperature. I didn't realize it was the Pfizer vaccine. Yep. And so um, the infrastructure for doing that, for instance, will require going to a small number of sites. You're not going to go to CVS to get that vaccine. Yeah. So maybe maybe there will be others, but you get my point, right? It's not there's unlikely to be a instant uh, fix here or, or or near panacea. On the other hand, the ninety percent efficacy they're reporting that's a very high number for vaccines. That's very very hopeful. I don't have anything else, John. Is there anything obvious that I should be asking, or anything you want to add? No, I think you you know you hit the major points here. I, I guess I would say this, yeah. Uh, if there's one word that captures what we've been dealing with, uh, and so much of society has been dealing with, you know, we've been keying off the word uncertainty. And so uncertainty is just ever present now in our life. And I think the fatigue that people are really feeling is, is the daily knowledge of uncertainty more than anything else. I think it's the fatigue that we know about and feel each of us is more about that than wearing a mask. And so dealing with uncertainty is something that, um, you know, we've had to get used to, but that's not been easy and we're not, I don't think we're ever really done with that. Sorry for the, sorry for the technical glitches at the start there again, uh, my apologies. No problem. Um, thank you both for your time, I appreciate it. Sure. All right, Eric.